Thank you for tuning in. We at Greater New Point pray that your experience with us today is blessed and helpful. For more information about our ministry, please visit us at greaternp.org. Let's listen in. God bless you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I am excited to be worshiping, worshiping with you this morning. Amen. I am Pastor Darren Thompson, pastor of Greater New Point Missionary Baptist Church in the great township of Irvington, New Jersey. Uh, we are excited to have you worshiping with us. Uh, of course, this is not our normal uh, form or fashion of worshiping, uh, but due to COVID-19 restrictions, uh, we are uh, restricted to worshiping virtually. Uh, so we are again, we are glad to have you with us. Let's let me open up by reading uh, our scripture for today, and then we'll have prayer. And then for prayer, we'll go into uh, a song, um, and then we'll go from there to the word. Amen. Our text for uh, our worship today is going to come from Psalm 100, uh, one of my favorite songs. Uh, there it says, Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generation. Amen. The word of the Lord is blessed. We pray that wherever you are, at home, at work, uh, at your, wherever you are, in the store, that uh, you will take this time to consecrate it uh, and give it back unto the Lord as we worship the Lord together on this blessed and wonderful day. Amen. Let's open up with covering prayer. Oh God, we thank you so much for being who you are and being merciful and gracious unto us. Thank you, God for blessing us to see this wonderful, wonderful Sunday, a day that we have never seen before. We pray, God, that in all things that you are pleased with the posture of our worship. We give you glory, we give you honor, we give you praise. God, even though we are not worshiping together physically, God, but thank you for technology that we are able still to worship together virtually. And we pray, God, that the church of Jesus Christ will continue to be who you have called her to be, to be uh, uh, soldiers, missionaries that can continue to preach the sound message of Jesus Christ to a dying world. Bless us now as we worship and fellowship together. Be with us. This is our prayer. In the strong and mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. May you worship with us today. Uh, may there be a song that you hear uh, on today that bless your life. And of course, may you be changed by the uh, powerful word of the Lord. Let's hear a song uh, of worship on today. Amen. Listen, 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 listen. It was right around this time in a service where somebody would stand up, used to be my grandmama, and she used to say, Everybody come go. Oh, come on, somebody. Y'all gonna need your tambourine this morning. Huh? Get your washboard. Get your tambourine. Let's have it this morning. And they used to say, here we go, dog. Said, can't nobody do me like Jesus.
Say, 
that we take as a church is feeling real Pentecostal in here this morning. Somebody else would jump up right here and say, Yes, I got it. Yes, I got it. Everlasting life. I say, Yes, I got it. Yes, I got it. Everlasting life. Yes, I got it. say to us on today. Um, I want to take a pause uh, again from our sermon series on the book of James um, and uh, just deal with several different passages throughout this season. Um, so let's look at uh, Joshua chapter 5 this morning. Joshua chapter 5. Um, and I want to begin at verse one, but let's pray first. Oh God, we thank you so much for being who you are in our life and thank you for being so gracious and merciful. Now God, as we prepare to hear what you have to say, I pray now, Lord, that you would allow your word to penetrate our hearts, uh, give us the encouragement, the hope and the strength that we need to face these times. I pray now that you will allow me to stand on the foundational truths of Jesus Christ, that someone who do not know Christ as their Savior may come into a saving faith with him. Enable your people to receive your word now, Holy Spirit, and enable me to preach it with power, your presence and passion. I commit this as an act of worship unto thee. So now let the words of my mouth and meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, for Lord, you are my strength and redeemer, and all of God's people said, amen, amen. Joshua chapter five, <clears throat> I want to begin at verse one. Um, there you'll find these words. I'm reading from the New King James Version. 
There it says, so it was when all the kings of the Amorites who were on the west side of the Jordan and all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan from before the children of Israel until we had crossed over that their heart melted and there was no spirit in them any longer because of the children of Israel. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives for yourself and circumcise the sons of Israel again the second time. So Joshua made flint knives for himself, circumcised the sons of Israel at the hill of the foreskin. And this is why the reason why Joshua circumcised them. All the people who came out of Egypt who were males, all the men of war, had died in the wilderness on the way after they had come out of Egypt. For all the people who came out had been circumcised. For all the people born in the wilderness on the way as they came out of Egypt had not been circumcised. For the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness to all the people who were men of war who came out of Egypt were consumed because they did not obey the voice of the Lord, to whom the Lord swore that he would not show them the land which the Lord had sworn to their fathers that he would give us, a land flowing with milk and honey. Then Joshua circumcised their sons with whom he raised up in their place, for they were uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. So it was when they had finished circumcising all the people that they stayed in their places in the camp till they were healed. Finally, verse nine, then the Lord said to Joshua, this day I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. Therefore, the name of this place is called Gilgal to this day. Amen. The word of the Lord is already blessed. For our time this morning, I want to label this message simply trusting God in vulnerable times. Trusting God in vulnerable times. When we look at the text, Joshua and children of Israel has crossed over the Jordan River and they are now in a place called Gilgal. They are uh, after wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, operating according to the will of God. Moses, their former leader, has died, and Moses' protege, Joshua, is now Israel's leader. Um, as I mentioned a few seconds ago, Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. <laughs> Think about that church, an 11 day journey ended up becoming 40 years because watch, Israel complained and disobeyed the will of God for their lives. So much so that God promised that the first generation of the children of Israel would not inherit the promised land. And, and let me just footnote here by suggesting that uh, perhaps there are some things, church, that will not happen for you, hear me, that will not happen for you or in your life until some people, some places, and some things die off from your life. Perhaps you haven't reached where God desires to take you yet because there are some folks and some habits around you and about you that really needs to die off. Amen. So getting back to the text, they wandered for 40 years, but God who is faithful and God who is a promise keeper blesses them to now enter into the land of Canaan and start their conquest into the promised land. This church is a vulnerable moment for Joshua and 
and for the children of Israel because, watch, this is a season of transition. Let me say that again. This is a vulnerable moment for Joshua and the children of Israel because this is a season of transition. Again, they, they left Egypt, um, wandered about in the wilderness. They lost their leader, Moses. They're now being led by Joshua, who is Moses' protege. They've crossed over the Jordan River, and now they're on their way to the promised land. So they are in seasons of transition. And, and one thing about transition, church, is, uh, hear me, transitions can be both glorious and terrifying at the same time. Transitions can be both glorious and terrifying at the same time. Why do you say that, preacher? I say that because it's glorious because if you're trusting in the sovereignty and the providence of God, you become excited about whatever God is doing in your life, in your church, at your job, and in the life around those that are around, that are around you because you know that God knows what's best for your life. But if you take that same record, flip it over and play the other side, it's frightening as well because first, you're going into unknown territory. And secondly, in seasons of transition, watch, in seasons of transition, we are tested, we are stretched by new circumstances and relationships, and it can be tempting to look back and to claim to the certainty and the comfort of the last season. But, but here's the beauty of being in both places while you're transitioning. If you are a child of God, if you are a believer of God, if you trust in the will, in the sovereignty of God, here's the beauty of it. God is right there with you. And since he's with you, God will be the one that will guide you and get you to the promised land safely and according to his own timing. And this is where we are in our text, beloved. Joshua and the children of Israel are now camped out at the doorstep of Jericho in the place called Gilgal. And what takes place in Gilgal causes the children of Israel, watch, to become vulnerable, to become vulnerable to their enemies. Being vulnerable, beloved, um, is, is not all that bad, especially when you're being vulnerable to God. Let me say that again. Being vulnerable is not all that bad, especially when you are being vulnerable to God. Um, if you think about it, for the most part, uh, we all do our best to put up the best version of ourselves when we are around other people, whether we know them or we don't know them at all. We, we try to put up our best version of ourselves and we do it on social media as well. And we should, we should try our best to put up the best version of of ourselves. You shouldn't feel comfortable exposing all of who you are uh, to just anybody. Everyone shouldn't have access of your life, of your life story that easy because not everybody really means you good. You have some folk that would love to expose your mess. You have some folks that would love to know your faults and let everybody know exactly what it is. But that is not how it is with God. God already knows where we are, what we've done, and yep, who we've done it with. He knows the good about us. He knows the bad about us. He knows the ugly about who we are. But here it is. God is just waiting for us to be vulnerable with him. He's waiting for us to tell him where we are, to tell him what we've done, to tell him how the way we feel. Uh, 
uh, let me bring my own witness into this. In Psalm 139, uh, David marvels at the way God knows everything about him. He says in Psalm 139, O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and, and, and you are acquainted with all my ways for there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O oh Lord, you know it all together. <laughs> he says, you have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. He says, it is, it is high. I cannot attain it. In verse seven, he says, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, Lord, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. And then at the end of that Psalm church, he embraces the opportunity to be vulnerable by asking God this. He says, God, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there are any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Watch. This is a bold prayer of David's uh, church because David the man after God's own heart sins. Uh, if you recall, he was an adulterer. David uh, became Bathsheba's baby daddy. He, he had her husband Uriah murdered on the battlefield. And watch, but even a sinful David realized that our best step often comes on the other side of a vulnerable prayer. And that's the point that I'm pushing, church. You want to get to where God wants you to go. If you want to get to that particular place, we all have to learn how to be vulnerable to God in our life, in our, our life. So I asked the question, uh, what do you do? How do you handle those moments when God places you in situations to make you become vulnerable? Good question. Let's dive into it. This is what we do. When God places us in those situations to make us become vulnerable, we trust God. We trust God. Wish I had more to tell you. We trust. We trust God. First, we trust God to handle our enemies. We trust God to handle our enemies. It's, it's in the text. Look how God handles Israel's enemies. The text says that, watch, the text says that when they heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan, from before the children of Israel until we had crossed over that their, their enemies, their hearts melted and there was no spirit in them any longer because of the children of Israel. Man, that's some good stuff there, church. That's some good stuff. It's, it's good because you don't always have to retaliate. You don't always have to fight. You don't always have to argue. You don't always have to get back at your enemies for the stuff they've done or the stuff they want to do to you. Uh, uh. Sometimes church God will step in and fight for you before your enemies even get to you. That's good. Stop worrying over what your enemy is up to. Stop worrying about what they're planning and plotting at your job and, and start living out your life according to the plans and purposes that God has for your life. Your victory and your deliverance is not based upon the response of your enemy, but your victory and your deliverance is based upon the providence and the sovereignty 
of the will of God. They heard. They heard. What did they hear, Darren? They heard that the Lord dried up the waters of the Jordan until everyone crossed over. Now, you may be asking, what's the significance of that? Why is that so significant? And why did their hearts melt and their spirits, they, they, there was no spirit left in them? Lo, let me tell you why. Let me tell you what's, what's happening here in this text. Let me talk to about this Jordan River. The, the Jordan River Church, I believe I shared this with you before, the Jordan River starts on Mount Hermon at an elevation of 7,000 feet and ends at the Dead Sea, which is about 1,200 feet below sea level. The distance between the beginning and the end is about 70 miles. But if you count all of the twists and the turns uh, that's there, it actually travels about 200 miles. During most of the year, the Jordan River was about 100 feet wide. But when the seasons changed, transitions, when the seasons changed and it started to get warm in which, according, uh, looking at the text, this was spring season. So the Jordan River was at its peak. The snow would, would melt, causing the Jordan to go from 100 feet wide to an overflowing river and becoming about a mile wide. The Jordan River Church was not a river that stood still like a, a small little lake or a pond, but the more water that dumped into the Jordan River, the more that the river flowed. The River Church was at flood stage, which made the Jordan River impossible to cross. And the children of Israel had a choice. You go back in Joshua, they had a choice to either trust what Joshua said God would do, or they could have stayed stuck at the banks of the river, gazing at their inheritance and waiting for the waters to subside. But the problem with waiting, church, is that when you wait, uh, you become outside of the will of God. And when God wants to move and do something specific in your life, hear me, God does not go by our timeline. God does not wait until we get all of our ducks in a row. But God moves according to his own timing so that when God blesses us, we don't steal any glory from him and try to put it all on ourselves. They crossed over to the other side. The kings of the Amorites and the Canaanites, according to the text, hear what God had done. And the text says that their hearts melted. But watch, <laughs> that's not all that happened. Their hearts melted and there was no spirit left in them any longer. That's some good stuff. Y'all should be shouting. So when the text says that their hearts melted, that simply means that they became terrified. They became afraid. They became acutely aware of who the children of Israel's power rested on, and they became frightened. So much so, church, they didn't even have it in them to even try to pursue the children of Israel anymore because the text says there was no spirit left in them. <laughs> Hear me. I don't care what your enemy has planned against you to hurt you, to harm you, to embarrass you, or to make you look like a fool to other people. Here's what you do. You just continue to trust in the sovereignty of who your God is. God will snatch away their courage. Yes, he will. God will cause their hearts to melt. Yeah, he will. God will snatch whatever drive they had in their spirit to pursue after you, not because of how good you dress. Nope, not because you've been in the church for a long time. Mm -mm. 
But God does it simply because you've trusted in his power. You've trusted in the living, in the willing, uh, the, the sovereignty of God. God does it because truthfully, church, he's the only one that can do it. Here's what you do. You trust God. Trust God. You trust God. Trust God to handle your enemies. Secondly, trust God by renewing your covenant to the Lord. Trust God by renewing your covenant to the Lord. That's verses two through seven. Watch. They're in Gilgal. And instead of capitalizing on the fact that their enemies are afraid afraid of them because of what verse one just testified about and what the Lord has done. Watch. God tells Joshua to circumcise all the men of Israel. <laughs> huh? Watch. God doesn't tell Joshua to circumcise not some, not a few of the men at a time. And then you know, create this continued cycle. Mm -mm. But God says to circumcise all of the men. Now, to be circumcised meant to cut away the foreskin because the foreskin um, had the potential to carry ailing diseases. And according to scripture, a male child in those days would have been circumcised within eight days of birth. So you, you, you really would have thought that these men would have been circumcised already. However, the men that were born during the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness had not been circumcised. And unfortunately, church, during 40 years of their wilderness wandering, Israel became so rebellious that they fell from following what God instructed them to do. Well, what did God instruct them to do? Good question. In Genesis chapter 17, verses 11 through 14, God told them, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins. And this shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He further says, he who is eight days old, among you shall be circumcised. Every male child in your generation, he who was born in your house or bought with money from any foreigner who is not your descendant, he who was born in your house or he who was uh, bought with your money must be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. Verse 14 there says, and the uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised, I'm going somewhere with this, who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Watch. The rebellious, unbelieving generation that were circumcised kept disobeying God. God, therefore, told them that they would not inherit the promised land, and they died while wandering in the wilderness. It's in the text. Their offspring is now ready to possess the land, but before they could inherit what was promised to them, they had to live in the reality of the covenant of God. Yeah. What was that covenant? Again, here it is. And you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between you and I. That's what the Lord says. Hear me, church. That's good. Our God is a covenant-keeping God. And since he's a covenant-keeping God, God will not ever go back on his word. Hallelujah, church. And if Israel wanted the blessings of God, if they wanted the peace of God and the promises of God, 
they had to cut away and renew their covenant with God. And I don't know, church, I don't know who I'm talking to, but before you can go forward to get what God has for you, before you can try to claim victory over the blessings of God, perhaps you need to start cutting away and renew your fellowship with God. You can't have the blessings of God without first having proper fellowship with God. So, so that means you have to cut some people off that's toxic, toxic for your Christian growth. You have to cut out from hanging in places that's no good for you to be, uh, to be at. You need to do away with those dark and nasty secrets that you do when you're all by yourself. And, and what we need to do, all of us need to do, we, we need to fall on our knees and tell the Lord, I'm sorry. Tell the Lord, I'm sorry I left you. Tell the Lord, I'm sorry I disappointed you. Tell the Lord, I'm sorry I did my will and not your will. The old song said, ask the Savior to help you. Comfort, strengthen, and keep you. He is willing to aid you. Jesus will carry you through. Beloved, I'm just simply saying is in order to get the blessings and the promises of God, sometimes we got to cut away and renew our fellowship with God. Amen. I'm almost done. Let me get to my last point and I'll bid you a good day. Trust God with your enemies. Trust God by cutting away and reestablishing a covenant with God. But finally, we need to trust God by reaffirming our confidence, reaffirming our confidence in God. Look at it. Verse eight says, so it was when they had finished circumcising all the people that they stayed in their places in the camp till they were healed. Um, anyone that knows anything about circumcision knows that circumcision at any age is a painful procedure. Circumcising the baby when they are a few days old is typically when the doctor would do it because babies at that tender age heals much faster than grown men do. Also, uh, a baby at that age can't do anything for themselves, so it's really no great loss, right? Baby can't get up and go to work. Baby can't get up and go to the bathroom. Baby can't go and cook or do other things. So it's no great loss. However, when grown men are circumcised, grown men are incapacitated from doing anything from, for several days. And watch, if the, we are, if a grown man is incapacitated, they are definitely not fit for war. So let's paint this picture. Let's paint this picture. Israel is camped out in the heart of enemy territory. After they have been circumcised, every male in the nation of Israel is temporarily disabled and they are uh, rendered unable to fight. Now, you tell me, what soldier in his right mind <laughs> will allow anyone to incapacitate him while in battle and while in enemy territory. Watch. In order for them to submit to being circumcised, knowing that it'll place them in a vulnerable state, took great confidence, took some trust, took a lot of faith. Watch not just in Joshua, but it took a lot of faith in the God that they serve. Jo Jer Jerry Bridges says, God's plans and God's ways are working out his plan, uh, are in, in working out his plans are frequently beyond our ability to fathom and understand. 
He says, we must learn to trust God even when we don't understand God. That's good. Hear me, church. Life at its best is only experience when you learn how to trust God beyond what you can feel, see, and understand. Let me say that again. Life at its best is only experience when you learn how to trust God beyond what we can feel, see, and understand. They had to be willing to trust the Lord to protect them until they were healed. And I just want to share with someone who feels like God uh, just finished operating on you. God just finished cutting away that which was no good for you. And you feel like you are now in a spiritual recovery room waiting for healing to happen. Let me encourage your heart. Don't throw in the towel. Don't become upset. Don't become frustrated. Don't become afraid. Trust God. Trust God that God will heal you. Trust God that God will restore back to you better than what you have lost. Trust God that God will fix your marriage. Trust God that God will fix those mean and nasty and evil people that's trying to plot behind your back at your job. Trust God that God will fix your issues and situations at home. Trust God that God will fix your alcohol or drug addiction. Trust and know that there's never a time that God will place you in the, into a situation where he doesn't first protect you and secondly cover you. James Brown, not that James Brown, <laughs> James Brown, an evangelist from the Evangeline Baptist Church in Wildsville, Louisiana, he says, there is no situation he can get into that God cannot ever get him out of. He gives his own testimony. He says some years ago when he was learning how to fly, his instructor told him to put the plane into a steep and extended dive. He was totally unprepared for what was about to happen. And after a brief time, the engine stalled and the plane began to plunge out of control. It soon became evident that the instructor was not going to help James at all. And after a few seconds, which to him seemed like an eternity, his mind began to function again and he quickly corrected the situation. After he corrected the situation, he immediately turned to his instructor and began to vent his fearful frustrations on him. And when he was done venting his frustrations, the instructor, the instructor very calmly said to James, he said, James, I need you to understand something. There's no position you can get this plane into that I, as your pilot and your teacher, cannot get you out of. If you want to learn how to fly, then I need you to go up there and do it all over again. And in the same sense, church, there is no situation you can ever get yourself into that God cannot get you out of. I think the point that I'm pushing for the new point is if you take God at his word in days to come, regardless of how bad it looks to you, God has a different agenda. It may look impossible to you, but how many of us know that with God, all things are possible when God is on our side? Amen. If you don't believe me, then let me call the roll. The same God that parted the Red Sea from Moses and Joshua and the children of Israel is the same God that's on your side. The same God that was with Shadrach, Meshach, and the Bendigo in the fiery furnace is the same God that's on your side. The same God that was with Daniel in the lion's den is the same God that's on your side. 
the same God that was with Jonah in the belly of a fish for three whole days is the same God that's on your side. If that didn't get you, let me tell you this, the same God that got Jesus out of the grave and he said, oh, power is in his hand is the same God that is with you. I don't know about you, church, but I'm grateful to God to know that even in moments when I can't fight for myself, God himself will get in the fight with us. Amen. Hallelujah. Let me push on. I got one more point to push in regards to trust. I didn't read this passage, but let me show you. Not only did the people and the soldiers needed to trust in God and reaffirm their confidence in, in of God, but Joshua needed to as well. Look at verses 13 to 15, and I'll be done. It says, and it came to pass. When Joshua was, was by Jericho, that he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, a man. Notice that capital M stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. Joshua went to him, to him and said to him, are you for us or for our adversaries? So he said, no, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth in the worship and said to him, what does my Lord say, say to his servant? The commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, watch, take your sandal off your foot for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. I'm done after this church. But watch, Jesus here tells Joshua to take off his sandal. Notice here in this passage of scripture, that's a whole nother sermon by itself. But notice here uh, that Jesus says sandal, uh, singular, instead of sandals. Also notice that he says uh, foot instead of foot. Feet, hmm, singular. The word sandal and foot noted here again is used in the singular sense and not in the plural sense. Why? Why would Jesus ask Joshua to take off just one sandal? Well, the obvious is that it was a sign of respect and honor of who Jesus is. And then Jesus also says, him, well, the angel of the Lord who, of course, we know is Jesus, also says, for the place where you stand is holy. But here's another reason why I believe that Joshua takes off his sandal as a sign of respect. Go with me to Ruth chapter 4, and we want to look at... Uh, Verse six, verse six through eight. The page stops sticking together. Ruth chapter the four. We want to look at verses six through eight. There it says, and I thought to inform you, saying. Buy it back in the presence of the inhabitants and the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not redeem it, then tell me that I may know, for there is no one but, to, but you to redeem it, and I am next after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, on the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also buy it from Ruth, the Moabites, the wife of the dead, um, the wife of the dead, to perpetrate the name of the dead through his inheritance. And the close relative said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I ruin my own inheritance. You redeem my right of redemption for yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now, this was, this is where I'm trying to push. Verse seven, now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging 
to confirm anything. One man took off his sandal and gave it to the other, and this was a confirmation in Israel. Therefore, the close relative said to Boaz, buy it for yourself. So he took off his sandals. I tell you, boy, the word of the Lord is so good. So the answer, church, lies in ancient custom. When the covenant was made between two individuals, hear me, in which one possessed power to keep the covenant and the other did not, the weaker individual handed the other individual one of his shoes. It was his way of saying, I can't, but you can. <laughs> Boy, that's good. Woo! When Joshua took off his shoe, church, it, was, it represented him saying to the angel of the Lord, I'm faced with a problem I can't handle. I've been standing here gazing at the city, wondering how I was going to overcome, how I was going to acquire what you've promised. I've decided to put my trust completely in you. I've decided to relinquish my will for your will. So I'm making the covenant to, to you to say that I can't, but I know you can. I can't fight my enemies on my own strength. I can't win the war by myself. I can't get to what you already promised me uh, to have. I can't defeat Jericho with my plan. So God, I need you to fight for me. So great, a new point. This is what I'm saying. All of us learn need to learn how to give him one shoe. If we want to acquire all that God has for us, Learn how to give God one shoe. Make a covenant with the Lord by saying to the Lord, I can't, but I know you can. Trust God during these vulnerable times. If you trust God, if you trust God, God will give you what you need. Listen, but in, this, in the same sense, trust in God, we also need to cut away some things. We also need to renew our covenant with the Lord. We also need to reassure our confidence in the Lord. And when we do that, God will bless us and get us to where we need to be. May God bless you. May God keep you. May heaven smile upon you. Let's prepare now. Uh, I pray that that word was helpful unto you. Uh, uh, and I also extend to you, my brother and my sister, those who do not know Christ as your Savior. I extend to you uh, this man that Joshua gave one shoe to. I extend that person to you. Give him one of your shoes. Give him one of your commitments. And making an open declaration to say, God, I, Lord, I'm the weaker vessel. I know I can't do it by myself, but you can. Come into my life. Save my life. Help me to be where you want me to be. I offer this Christ to you, my brother, my sister. Amen. That's all it takes. If you believe in the person of Jesus Christ, believe that he, he is the son of God, that he died for your sins, that he rose from the dead, that he's coming back again, you shall be saved you have, if you believe in that, my brother, my sister, you are saved. We offer you to continue to follow this Christ by engaging yourself in the Bible, believing church. Uh, you can uh, at, uh, follow us on, go to our website, greaternp.org and complete the connection card and we will definitely get back to you, reach back out to you immediately, and continue to talk about this Christ that we call Jesus Christ our Savior. Let's prepare our hearts and minds now for our Lord's Supper. His blood will never, ever lose its power. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It never loses its power. Amen. First Corinthians chapter 11, 
and verse 23, there the reading says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Like man in verse 25 there, it says in the same way, he also took the cup after supper saying, this is the cup, which is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes back again. Brother and sister, we are so grateful for the bread and the wine that demonstrates the Lord's body and blood. We are grateful for the sacrifice that he has made, amen, to bridge the gap and to connect the hands of mankind to the hands of God, amen, that we are now in proper fellowship have a relationship with God our Father because of Jesus Christ. Let's pray over these ordinances. Oh God, we thank you so much for the sacrifice that you have made. Thank you, God, for blessing us to have a Savior that in spite of our sin, God, you looked beyond our faults and you saw our chief needs and you provided a Savior in, in which God we really don't deserve. But we thank you God for his life, his death, his burial and his resurrection. I pray now God, that as we take this bread and this wine, that we will always remember the sacrifice that you have made through by Jesus Christ. Bless us now and keep us. This is our prayer in Jesus name, amen. He took the bread, he offered it up to his father, blessed it, broke it, passed it amongst his disciples, and said, take ye and eat. And as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me to show forth my death. Take ye and eat all. Like manna, he took the pitcher and the cup and poured the wine into the cup. And he said, as this blood flows into this cup, this wine flows into this cup. This is how my blood shall be shed for you. Beloved, take ye and drink all. And as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me to show forth my death. Again, we thank God for the blood stained banner. We thank God for the bloodshed of Jesus Christ. Had it not been for his blood, had it not been for his sacrifice, hell would be our destination. But oh, we thank God that he died on an old rugged cross for our sins. And for that alone, beloved, we ought to be rejoicing and thanking God and saying hallelujah and praising God for what he has done. As we close our worship on today, may God continue to bless you and keep you. May heaven smile upon you uh, until we meet again. I look forward to worshiping, praying with you on tomorrow, on Monday at noon, on Friday at noon. Again, we want to continue to pray for all of our sick and shunning. May God bless you. May God keep you. May heaven smile upon you. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us. For more information about our ministry, visit us at www.greaternp.org. May God bless you.